Spadaro, Assistant Controller General of the United States U.S. General Accounting Office. He will be accompanied by Robert F. Dacey, Director of the Consolidated Audit and Computer Security Issues Accounting and Information Management Division of GAO, Philip Calder, Chief Accountant, and Linda Kalbom, the Director of Civil Audits. I think most of you know the routine. Uh, if you'll please stand and raise your right hand. You swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note that all four witnesses have affirmed the oath. Uh, Mr. Dodaro, it's always a pleasure to have you here. I'm going to ask you to start with one thing that isn't in your statement, and that is if a citizen wants to get a copy of this report, is it going to be on GAO's World Wide Web? And if so, let's get it in the record at this point. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it was posted to the GAO website uh, yesterday, uh, so it was available to all the citizens uh, through that page uh, immediately as we had it published. Well, you can give us the uh, www. What? Uh, GAO.gov. Gov, Gov uh, is after the GAO or first? It's first. GAO is first. www.gao.gov. GOV, very good. That's all they need to do, That's right? It. The marvels of technology. Please go ahead. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. Uh, in addition to the uh, people at the table with me today, before I start my remarks, I'd like to recognize the senior management team of, of GAO that worked with the inspector generals and the CFOs across the government, in addition to OMB and Treasury, and carrying this out this first ever audit of the Consolidated Financial Statements. Behind me is this, the team of uh, George Stalkup, Greg Coots, Gary Engel, Lisa Jacobson, Gloria Jarman, and Jeff Steinhoff, who was uh, part of the original crafting of the uh, CFO Act and providing service to the Congress, as well as Don Chapin, uh, who was a former chief accountant at GAO, worked on these issues for a long period of time. It's uh, And even if you have four feet of books in your lap. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay, <laughs> fine. We thank you very much. Uh, you've all done a marvelous job over the years, and we've learned to trust you. I appreciate that recognition, Mr. Chairman. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to publicly thank all the inspector generals and the CFOs uh, throughout the government who cooperated with us in OMB and Treasury in carrying out this historic first audit of the United States government's financial statements. Uh, preparations for this type of uh, improvement in federal financial management have, have been underway for a number of years now. In the last few years, we've put in place, uh, in conjunction with OMB and Treasury, a, a set of accounting standards for the federal government. As you mentioned in your opening statement, we now have uh, audits done of all the major departments and agencies. So for the first time, the federal government is subjecting itself to the same type of, of rigors and fiscal discipline that uh, have been in place in the private sector and state and local governments for a number of years. And it's beginning to uh, produce some good results, as you noted. However, there's a lot of work that lies ahead in order for the government to be able to pass the test of, of an audit. And what our report does is really highlight what those major challenges are. Now, the report itself, as noted in your opening statements, itemizes all the various uh, uh, issues and deficiencies that need to be attended to, and we've got a commitment from OMB and Treasury to move forward and address them. What I'd like to do this morning in my opening remarks is just highlight some of the more uh, serious areas that need attention and that need work. The first is property, plant, equipment, operating materials, and supplies. These categories of, of uh, equipment and, and computers and, and the necessary tools to carry out government activities represent about two-thirds of the government's assets. However, we found that hundreds of billions of dollars of the reported $1.2 trillion uh, on the uh, financial statements was not adequately supported by accounting or logistical records. Now, the biggest uh, area here is at the Department of Defense. Uh, defense accounts for roughly 80 percent of all these assets. And one of the reasons that defense has not been able to obtain a clean opinion on its financial statements, or for that matter, any opinion so far by the Department of Defense IG, uh, is because of problems in this particular area in properly accounting for its assets. 
uh, no major military service, Army, Air Force, Navy, have been able to receive anything other than a disclaimer of opinion. Uh, so this is an issue. I also want to point out that it's an issue in civilian agencies as well. There are problems in this area at FAA, at the Forest Service, just to name a, a couple of, of areas. Uh, our view is until we can get proper accounting in place for these assets, uh, the federal government is limited in its ability to make sure that they're adequately safeguarded, that we know their location, their condition, that we're not ordering materials and supplies that we already on, have on hand or incurring unnecessary costs uh, to store items that we really don't need. Uh, the second major category is in the loans and loan receivables area. Uh, the federal government is a guarantor of approximately $700 billion in loan guarantees. And we need to know at the federal government what our exposure is for defaults on those loans. Currently, there's not uh, adequate historical data or current information on loan uh, portfolios necessary to make the estimates to make sure that we, the liability uh, potentially for the government uh, for those loan guarantee portfolios is adequately stated. And this is important so we know the downstream costs of, of these programs. Uh, similar problems impede the ability to estimate the net receivables from direct loans uh, as well. In other words, how much money we've loaned people directly and what's the likely loss to be incurred through defaults on those loans uh, as well. So that's a, another area. A number of credit agencies are working on this uh, issue, uh, but it's yet to be overcome. Third major area I wanted to highlight is the environmental and disposal liabilities area. This is one area in the financial statements that we know is understated. There's about $212 billion there, and that represents largely the amount of money reported by the Energy Department uh, for cleaning up our nuclear weapons complex. We think that's a good number, but it doesn't include the cost of cleaning up ammunition, weapon systems, and a number of other disposal activities of the Department of Defense. So that number is clearly uh, understated. Uh, uh, also, uh, as you mentioned in your opening statements, uh, we're concerned about the amount of money, billions of dollars in improper payments. And you highlighted those areas in your opening statements of Medicare, uh, rent subsidies, supplemental security income. But our report also notes that we're concerned that in other areas, such as Medicaid, uh, to name one, we don't have estimates yet. So we don't really know what the full range of uh, payments that are being made that should not have been made, and we're going to be encouraging the administration to move forward in those areas. Uh, finally, the category I wanted to mention uh, is sort of a set of government-wide uh, accounting issues, and they really have three dimensions. Number one, right now the Treasury Department does not have in place a process to eliminate transactions among federal agencies. And there's a great deal of business that takes place within the federal government. And as a result, uh, there was about uh, well over $100 billion, close to $140 billion of gross uh, 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 transactions that could not be eliminated. Now, they netted out to $12 billion, and that $12 billion was put in uh, uh, as a, as a uh, plug figure into the financial statements in order to make them balance. But we need to have a process in place to properly eliminate those transactions so that they can be recorded properly. Uh, the second major category is that Treasury, or dimension of this, is that Treasury is really operates as the banker for the federal government, but the agency's records on cash disbursements and their fund balance with Treasury don't equal uh, what Treasury has on their books. So there are a lot of billions of dollars of differences between Treasury records and agency records that need to be properly reconciled. The third category is that now that we have audited financial statements of individual departments and agencies, that data needs to be consistent with the data Treasury uses to compile the uh, government-wide financial statements. And this year, we were unable, several agencies were unable to provide assurance that that, in fact, uh, happened. So there were hundreds of billions of dollars in adjustments that we suggested in order to correct that situation as well. So those government-wide accounting issues need to be addressed in order to make sure that the financial statements can be reliable and that all the cost information is properly allocated to the government's functional areas. Now, in addition to the problems that we noted 
on the reliability of the financial data presented in the statements. There are a couple of other uh, control issues that I wanted to really underscore this morning. Uh, the first is in the computer security area. This is a very serious problem. Uh, unauthorized access to uh, data, uh, particularly given the interconnected nature of our computer systems, uh, we have found uh, serious problems across most of the federal agencies that we've looked at. And this subjects potentially financial transactions to uh, being uh, erroneously manipulated, data being destroyed, and people having access to sensitive data that I'm sure the American public would not want uh, and is trusting their government to, to protect. Um, in addition, uh, we highlight the potential consequences of the year 2000 problem for the ability of the government to properly record their transactions. As this committee uh, needs no introduction to that issue, I was here two weeks ago talking about the full range of implications there, but there's one point I wanted to underscore here again this morning. One is that we have existing weaknesses in computer security systems. Over the next couple of years, there's going to be intensive efforts under very severe time pressures to fix the year 2000 problem. And I'm concerned that we need to be vigilant to make sure that the security is not jeopardized or further compromised in order to make all these changes that need to be made for the year 2000 problem. So it's something we're, uh, we wanted to elevate to the attention of people uh, because uh, I can't think of any one particular time in, in history where so many systems will be repaired or replaced at one time. And as you know, the time pressures are, are, uh, are waning in terms of the government's ability to get this done. Now, as we, uh, in conclusion, as we look toward the future, uh, what are the prospects look like? We're encouraged uh, by a number of things. Number one, uh, more federal agencies are starting to get unqualified or clean opinions. Uh, we're making gradual progress in that area. We also this year were able to uh, get a good handle on some major parts of the federal government. Uh, GAO was able to give an unqualified opinion on the Bureau of Public Debt, uh, so we know that the $3.8 trillion that we owe the public is properly stated, the interest on the debt is, is properly calculated. Uh, we were also able for the first time ever to give IRS a clean opinion on the amount, total amount of revenue that has been uh, collected. Uh, and we have other major agencies, as you noted, uh, Defense, NASA, and Social Security. So we have some good progress to build upon, but we've got some other big parts of the government that just aren't there yet, and it's going to take a concerted effort. Uh, I'm also encouraged by the fact that there's been a, a commitment in the, in the President's budget in terms of priority management objectives to get clean opinions on all the agencies. I note some of the agencies have included getting a clean opinion as a performance measure under the, the Results Act, which is a good thing, uh, and a number of the performance measures themselves are being derived from the financial statements. So that's another good uh, development as well. And there's a commitment to get a clean opinion on the government-wide statements. It won't be easy, uh, but uh, I want to uh, end and close my remarks by assuring the Congress that we're committed to GAO to continue to work with uh, the executive branch in order to bring about the reforms that were intended by the CFO Act, which were to get clean opinions, but more importantly than that, to have complete reliable information throughout the year in order to manage the government's activities and give the American people the type of accountability and confidence in government that they really deserve. So thank you very much, well, Mr. Chairman. We'd be I, happy to answer any I, questions. I thank you for your usual outstanding presentation here without a note in front of you, I might add. Uh, and we're going to need your chair temporarily, oh, okay. uh, <laughs> Mr. Controller General, to get for the majority leader. So, Gene, take a seat there where you can relax, and we're going to have the majority leader of the United States House of Representatives come forward for testimony on this. Let me say, as Dr. Army comes here, uh, he's not only a Ph.D. and a former professor, a Ph.D. in economics, but he has been the real leader in terms of the Congress reviewing the Results Act strategic plans, in terms of the performance indicators that are going to grow out of these uh, plans. And I might say uh, from my study of Congress for 200 years, not for me, but for the period, 
uh, no majority leader in history has ever taken as much of an interest in getting results out of the executive branch as this majority leader. So, uh, Mr. Mr. Army Chairman, of Texas, we're delighted to have Mr. you here. Chairman, I'd ask for a point of personal privilege. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chairman, you I mean would two like Texans shouldn't be in the room at the same time? Or, Mr. Uh, Chairman, I would like to state that, uh, adding on to what you've said, that I believe that Congressman Army not only has consistently been, but is the greatest congressman in the history of the United States Congress. And I am very proud to have him as our majority leader because he is worried about things that, that people who sit around their families' tables talk about. That's what he talks about daily that we should be concerned with here in Congress. And when we're talking about people and problems, he believes there's no problem in this country that cannot be solved but it takes people who can work hard on that and be honest and tell the truth about it, and that's our Dick Army. Thank you. You obviously are in a friendly climate here. <laughs> uh, thank you, Mr. Horne, and, and, and thank you, Mr. Sessions. Uh, let me thank this committee for the hard work you've already invested in this subject and for holding these hearings. And let me thank the uh, General Accounting Office for the enormous effort they've put forth with over 300 people that have been working on this, and I was listening to Gene Dodder thinking about my own daughter, who is an internal auditor with a fairly large corporation in Dallas. And it just causes me to want to begin my statements by saying, pity the poor auditor. Wherever he or she shows up, they are inevitably the skunk at the garden party. Nobody wants to see them there. They're going to be bothered. They're going to be troubled. They're going to be uh, accurately measuring what you do and how you do it and what you've done with the resources. and. Uh, holds you accountable, and uh, it's not a pleasant job, but you know, the interesting thing about it is a job that is done, if only at the most intuitive levels, by all of us, and a job we recognize, again, only intuitively, must need to be done. Uh, we do it, for example, in the casual business of sitting around the kitchen table examining our budgets and wondering, how did we do? Are we doing well? Are we met our priorities? Do we need to reallocate? Uh, where was the waste and the inefficiency? Uh, my wife and I do that, and one of the things that's interesting about that is in this kind of relationship, we, be, we become each other's auditors, and I couldn't re help but reflect, and I'll be talking in a little detail later about some of the problems you have when things get lost. My auditor, that is my wife Susan, caught up with me just last week when she recalled that some time ago I had bought a small, and portable $500 bass boat, which I had subsequently lent to my sons, which they subsequently lent to someplace else, and we now realize that it has been subsequently lost. And uh, my auditor held me accountable for it, and uh, as I go home at recess, one of the things that I will do in addition to working with my constituents is complying with the results of the audit and finding that little bass boat. <laughs> That these things must be done. Well, that may be a homely example of the way we conduct this, this process rather informally among ourselves. As, of course, enterprises become larger and more sophisticated, more complex, then auditing becomes more of a formal and more of a rigorous process following defined procedures. We understood the need for auditing when we assumed the majority of Congress in, in uh, January of 1995, and one of the first things we did was the first time ever audit of Congress, of the House of Representatives. And we were amazed at the state of disorder we found. It took us a long time, of course, to fully comprehend what all needed to be corrected and how we might best correct things, but at this point, we are now able to operate the legislative branch of government at $200 million a year less than it was operated before we took it over. So. The first thing that I would say to each and every one of these agencies uh, that we will deal with as we proceed with this report is, if you feel like the House is beleaguering you, at least be consoled by the fact we started with ourselves some two and a half years ago. And uh, we are trying to find and continuing to find each day better oppor opportunities to comply with the audit. This audit, first time ever audit of the federal government has been an enormous task and it, and it has been, I suppose, 
uh, a discouraging set of discoveries. On the other hand, if even in our own families we were to go for any extended period of time without these homely little kitchen table audits, we would probably find things in a bit of a mess too. So we shouldn't be alarmed, and I don't think we ought to be discouraged. I think, in fact, uh, we ought to understand that these discoveries, this information, this good work by the General Accounting Office uh, brings clarity of understanding to what it is we have, how are we effectively using our resources, and how can we improve. So I would, I would hope that my short remarks today will be a, a message of encouragement to everybody. The auditing, we know, is a painful process. But it's a necessary process and can be a very, very beneficial process. I, I am uh, struck by some of the discoveries we have. The fact that we end up with a $12 billion plug in the budget just to make the, <laughs> the results come out. Sometimes in a commercial enterprise, that's called owner's equity. Uh, but you have, to, you have to make your assets equal your debits on paper as they do in fact in real life. But the more you can account that and the more you can pare such a plug as this down to a smaller and smaller number, the more you will have a more full and complete accounting. I was uh, also struck by some of the things we discovered of what we do have uh, and some of the things we discovered of what we do not have. Pete Sessions uh, has learned that the Pentagon owns uh, a 200-year supply of raincoats. And, you know, and, uh, my first reaction is that, well, everybody thinks they ought to have a rainy day fund. Maybe this is the Pentagon version of that. I don't know. But I don't know how much we need a 200-year supply of raincoats and perhaps excessive uh, uh, inventories, uh, if properly understood and properly controlled, might be able to give us some of the cost efficiencies that our defense actually literally needs. So again, I would see this discovery as, as information obtained that will help the military to be more effective and, if you'll pardon the pun, get better bang for their buck uh, on the field. The things that I found uh, that were just apparently just lost were some solace to me, and I'll be happy to point these out to my wife when I go home when uh, she uh, finds me defending my $500 portable bass boat. Uh, because someplace in the government we have lost two utility boats valued at $174,000 each. Uh, two large harbor tugboats valued at $875,000 each. One floating crane valued at $468,000. You know, one of the things that amazes me, and I always am impressed at the uh, heights that are attainable by the government, how can you lose a crane that size? You would think somebody would notice it somewhere, but. Uh, we also have 15 aircraft engines, including the two F-18 engines valued at $4 million each, and, and then one, uh, and sometimes these things, I might say, can be distressing to uh, an Avenger missile launcher valued at a $1 million. And uh, I think well, we have a picture of this missile launcher. Now, that's not your average recreational vehicle. I'm going to just bet that somebody in America has seen this <clears throat> and as a citizen's duty might want to report to us where this being operated. Certainly not on the deserts of Southern California, Mr. Mr. Chairman, but uh, it's conceivable it could show up in Texas. At any rate, while I think we ought to keep our sense of humor, and uh, we should also appreciate that in an audit that is this comprehensive, this complete, and this rigorous, and so much a first unique event in the history of so many people in this government who have frankly labored without the discipline of audits that are known to be so essential to the effective operation of any enterprise in the private sector, that we should know that this is a purpose of discovering, a purpose of acquiring the information, the coordination of information, the clarity of knowledge about ourselves in the performance of our duty, 
that if taken with a good sense of humor and a good appreciation for one another and our foibles, because we're always, uh, each and every one of them have them. I'm sure that I have just created before us now the most famous portable bass boat in America at this moment, lost one, that is. But let's keep our sense of humor while at the same time we retain a disciplined respect for the process, for the need to conduct the process, and a healthy optimism and a great expectation for what results we can obtain on behalf of the American people as we complete this. Now, one final point. There is a natural resistance to change and to discipline change. And especially when it is somebody that's like an auditor from the outside to show up with their good advice. And I'm fond of pointing out to people, I don't need your good advice, I can get in trouble on my own. There will be, a, I think, a resistance to that. We are asking the government to take on, in each and every agency, a new discipline, a new uh, self-examination, a new acceptance of criticism and a new resolve to correct mistakes, errors, and misallocations of resources. We need to approach that with an understanding that this is no, no more easy for somebody in an agency down the street than it is for you and me in our own personal lives or in the operation of our congressional office or in the operation of the committee. But these things are necessary, and they're part of our duty and our responsibility. I know that in Washington, it is popular to try to encourage people by using the greatest encourager of all, the expression, you owe it to yourself. But in this case, that is not where the debt lies. We owe it to the American people and to the service that government must be in the lives of the American people to accept this rigor, accept this responsibility, accept this duty, and see the job through. So once again, let me thank you for your work in the committee. Your discovery has already been uh, very important and very, uh, I think, encouraging to other agencies. And let me uh, thank the GAO, probably the largest and most uh, misbegotten group of skunks at garden parties in America today. But they're doing a good job, and we love them. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for uh, your testimony. Uh, I remember as a 10-year-old seeing a, something like that without the missile bit. They used to call it the duck, and I'm thinking maybe if you got one of those old ducks that you'd have a very good bass boat. So good luck. Now we will go to the second panel, and Mr. Dodaro can have a rest for a while, and then we'll ask him to come back after the second panel is concluded. And that is the panel from the administration. We have today uh, Mr. Edward DeSiv, the Acting Controller and Acting Deputy Director for Management of the Office of Management and Budget, which is the President's uh, essential organization to manage the executive branch of the government on his behalf. And Mr. Gerald Murphy, the Senior Advisor to the Undersecretary for Domestic Finance in the Department of the Treasury. And he's accompanied by the Honorable John D. Hawk, Undersecretary for Domestic Finance of the Department of the Treasury. Uh, so, gentlemen, you know the routine here also. If you'd stand, raise your uh, right hand. Uh, you swear the testimony you're about to give this subcommittee is the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. The clerk will note that all three witnesses have affirmed the oath. And uh, please proceed in any order you'd like. Uh, I have down. Uh, Mr. DeSiv, but if the Undersecretary would like to speak, we'll start with Mr. DeSiv, who's been managing this process within the executive branch. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. I want to thank you, and I want to thank the members, and I especially want to thank uh, Mr. Army. I thought his remarks were statesmanlike and right to the point, very well put. I'm here today to discuss the results of the first ever audit of the federal government's consolidated financial statement. We welcome the Congress's interest in this process and look forward to your support as we continue to work together to correct the decade-old old weaknesses identified by the General Accounting Office in its audit. Uh, last night, I characterized this as uh, cleaning out a closet 
that was 200 years old and finding things in there that really dismayed you and things that really needed a lot of attention. And that's the way I, I feel about this, and that's the way we're approaching this. The Clinton administration has aggressively advocated accountability, including financial statement audits, since the beginning of this administration. In September 1993, the National Performance Review recommended that the federal government prepare an annual consolidated audited financial report. In addition, the NPR supported the creation of a comprehensive set of basic accounting standards for the federal government. In the latter instance, NPR was critical of the amount of time it was taking to put accounting standards in place. The administration, in agreeing with the NPR recommendations, committed to have a basic set of accounting standards in place and we've met that commitment. In 1994, the administration strongly supported and the president eagerly signed the Government Management Reform Act to require all major agencies and the government as a whole to prepare and have audited financial statements. We did this to create a clear basis for addressing accumulated problems in financial and asset management. We knew from the beginning that this massive undertaking could not be completed in the first year nor in the second year. For several agencies, it will take many years to obtain an unqualified opinion. But we expect to see improvements each year in accuracy, reliability, and, Mr. Chairman, in timeliness of agency financial statements. We've seen that progress. I have a simpler chart uh, to some extent than the one you use, but I think it just is a point in time. Uh, it, it has the same kinds of numbers that you had. Um, in 1994, only 33 percent of agencies were audited. Now in 1997, 96%, 23 out of 24 are fully audited. One FEMA is partially audited. So there's a, a progress just getting the audits done. And again, 18%, four agencies had clean statements in 1994. Now with a couple of the incompletes that you appropriately put on your chart, and I, in, I applaud your scorecard by the way, I think it was well done, I think it was thoughtfully done. Um, 46% of the agencies with the two we expect, and we could be wrong, could be only one of the two, but we think there'll be two more, uh, will be audited. Is that, is that good? No. We need to do better. We all need to do better. We want to show progress each year. The first steps toward implementing the Government Management Reform Act for agency audits for FY96 and a government-wide audit for FY97 was to put in place policies and procedures to issue accounting standards. As a founding member of the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, OMB worked with Treasury, other executive branch agencies, GAO, CBO, and private sector representatives in order to create the standards from scratch. According to the current well-recognized chairman of FASAB, the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board, these standards were produced quickly compared to other standard-setting bodies and encompass a broader range of issues than those bodies are used to dealing with. Recognizing that we did not expect to receive an unqualified opinion on the first consolidated financial statement, the President's fiscal year 1999 budget includes a target for having a clean audit opinion on the major government-wide statement by FY99. In addition, 23 of 24 agencies target timely, clean opinions for FY2000. Could I have the next chart, please? We've been tracking these in the fi financial management community since 1995. This is the executive summary of the CFO five-year plan and status report. One of the things we want to track are not just the agencies themselves. Many, in many cases, that hides, that hides even more important components. For example, in the Defense Department, the Army, Navy, Air Force, and so on are components. The IRS is a component. So we track those as well. We also track government corporations. There are large government corporations out there. They've had a longer history and as a result are more successful. On average, as you see, the components are less successful than the departments. On average, the corporations, like the federal home loan bank system, a very large government corporation, have been doing it longer and are more successful. So here again we see that if you've been at it a while, you tend to be good at it. We've been in our federal financial management five-year plan and status report for 95. 96, and finally for 97, been tracking these in detail. The CFOs look at these and keep score on themselves. And you'll see the timeliness again is shown here. And we want to continue to do that. In its report, GAO states, and we concur, 
Considerable effort is already underway to make such improvements to show that progress. Several agencies which have been audited for a number of years face serious deficiencies in their initial audits and have made good progress in resolving them. This is all a GAO quote. With concerted effort, and that's what we really are here to talk about today, the federal government as a whole can continue to make progress toward generating reliable information on a regular basis. Mr. Sessions, I agree with you. There is no other standard but reliable information on a, on a, on a regular basis that's acceptable. There's been good progress over, this, over the last several years. Specific success stories include government savings identified as a result of agency audits, as well as clean opinions for the Internal Revenue Service, GSA, Social Security, Bureau of Public Debt, and Department of Energy. The administration specifically rejected granting waivers. The statute GMRA allowed us, allowed me actually, to grant waivers for this purpose. We said no waivers. GAO has indicated that that no waivers policy, subjecting everybody regardless, was a key ingredient in getting as good information as they have. It's not good information, but as good as it was. Characterizing the joint efforts of OMB, GAO, the agencies, and Treasury, Barry Mellencamp, President and CEO of the AICPA, says, taxpayers deserve no less than a full accounting. As a catalyst for change, audited financial statements provide a framework in which to evaluate the government's financial management tax dollars and to initiate any corrective actions. I think that, that is, is well put. The administration has identified a series of actions needed to correct the weaknesses in the consolidated audit, and these plans are in the midst of implementation. For example, at DOD, completing a new accounting systems architecture, re reviewing inventory accounting processes, and developing a government-wide property accountability system is key to the government-wide statement. As well, Treasury has set up um, efforts with agencies to ensure effective cash disbursement reconciliation or providing frequent analysis of cash receipts and disbursements. Treasury and OMB are coordinating efforts to resolve problems agencies have in eliminating transactions among themselves. We'll include with that the use has already been piloted of bank cards, where money doesn't leave the government, but it provides us a good reconciliation. Just as your bank statement includes all of the checks you wrote, we can use this network that banks create, private sector network, to reconcile our intergovernmental payments without the money ever leaving the Treasury. It would be silly to send it out to the banking system and take it back among our own payments. <clears throat> In conclusion, Treasury, the agencies, and GAO have completed a massive task on time. And again, Mr. Chairman, uh, timeliness is very important. On time. The first ever audit was the largest ever undertaken in history. Someone has suggested Hammurabi may have done a larger one at some point. We're researching that. It required massive transmissions of data, uh, reconciliations that have never been attempted before. Getting the agency data to Treasury, preparation of financial statements, and complete, completion of GAO's review required close coordination over several years. Jerry Murphy, Gene Dodaro, and I have gone out now for three years in a row to the agencies as a group, getting them ready, getting them ready over that three-year period. GAO Action Controller General Jim Hinchman has said, completion of this effort on time was a credit to all who participated, and I agree. As we complete the FY97 audit process, plans are already in place and are being developed for the FY98 process. Agencies will have a higher standard, a higher standard. New accounting standards are kicking in in FY98. Some of them may go down in your grading system, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, new accounting standards on revenue and cost accounting are effective for FY98. These new standards will prove difficult for many agencies, but they're essential to GPRA. If we can't get good cost accounting information, we can't do the kind of work that is necessary in GPRA. We expect to see improvements next year, and I'm working hard to make that expectation a reality. Again, in the five-year plan, we show year by year how many clean opinions we, we expect. We set a high bar, and some folks may not make that bar. We also show the timeliness of those opinions. We'll stand by this document, which we revise each year, and it will give you uh, a plan scorecard. And you can do the actuals. We'll do the plan, and you can do the actuals over time. That concludes my remarks, and uh, at the appropriate time, I'll be happy to take any questions. Jerry? Uh, well, we thank you very much uh, for that statement. And uh, before I uh, uh, have Mr. Murphy start his uh, particular uh, statement to the committee, I want to note something about Mr. Murphy. He's a good example of a uh, career civil servant uh, in two fine departments. Uh, he started when I was in graduate school with the Navy in 1957 
and then moved over to Treasury in 1959. Now, in the 50s, I want you to know that the Navy had the finest personnel program in this city, as I recall, and uh, Treasury has historically had a very fine program for civil servants, and Mr. Murphy has hit all of those various points. He was Assistant Secretary for Fiscal Affairs and held numerous positions besides the one I mentioned in introducing him as uh, the uh, senior advisor to the undersecretary for uh, domestic finance. And uh, the senior to whom he reports is right to uh, his right and my left. But what I'm introducing you for, Mr. Murphy, is you are a certified public accountant. You're a former president of the Association of Government Accountants. And before you even start on that statement, I want you to tell me in simple English on what net cost is as seen in this particular consolidated statement. I think that's something that uh, a lot of people will not understand. So if you can just speak from your heart on the great uh, idea of net cost. You get to it on page three of your statement, but there isn't a full explanation. And then we'll let you go ahead. Y you want me to answer yeah. that question first? I want, I want that <laughs> question first, and then I'll be glad to hear the statement. Yes. Uh, the focus of the financial statements as uh, prescribed and encouraged by the Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board is to, to focus on net cost, meaning the cost of government operations on an accrual basis less the related uh, exchange type revenues, those revenues that we, we generate as a result of some of our operations. So we come up to a, a net cost figure there. Um, that doesn't include then the gross revenues, the non-exchange revenues, the various taxes that the government collects to finance that net cost. Okay. <laughs> now the accrual, the accrual aspect goes back to a recommendation of the Hoover Commission in 1949 and 1952, but we don't really apply it too often, but I take it we are applying it now. We are now. It's been a long struggle. Right. Uh, the, um, at, at one it's point in time, century. the accrual accounting seemed to be too complex for laymen to grasp, and there wasn't a great deal of interest in it. Uh, everyone has embraced that because it's necessary in order to come up with good cost data, which in time will be able to compare to those performance measures prescribed under the Government Performance and Results Act. Very good. Well, proceed with your uh, statement now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you uh, for the introduction. I wasn't expecting that. Uh, Mr. DeSev has covered a number of things in my testimony, uh, and rather than be redundant, I'd like to submit my full statement for the record, and I'll summarize it for you. That objection is inserted as are all statements the minute you, we introduce you. They're already shipping it down to GPO. <laughs> The, uh, the Department of Treasury has been and continues to be a strong proponent for the development of financial statements by government agencies. Uh, this is the first time audit has, has been pointed out, and it is the capstone of a process that began uh, eight years ago. In 1990, the Office of Management and Budget, the Treasury, and the General Accounting Office created a new Federal Accounting Standards Advisory Board to come up with a comprehensive set of generally accepted accounting standards that we could all follow. And that process is still underway. The basic core requirements came out in FY 1996, but there were brand new standards that were applicable for the first time in 97, and there are four more new standards coming out in 1998. So as agencies are attempting to improve their financial systems, they're, we're also raising the bar on them, so to speak, because new standards coming out each year provide new challenges for agencies to comply with. But we now have, as Mr. Seb pointed out, the 24 largest executive departments and agencies being audited. We have the government corporations also being audited. The consolidated financial statement is based on those agency statements and the agency audits. Under the Government Management Reform Act, 
as you mentioned, Mr. Chairman, the statutory due date for Treasury and GAO to produce this audited consolidated statement was March 31. Uh, we also took note of the fact that the statute requires the agency audited statements by March 1. And we knew that the General Accounting Office, in order to render its audit opinion by the 31st of March, would need consolidated numbers from the Treasury by the middle of March. Uh, we also knew that from prior year experience, some agencies were going to have difficulty meeting that March 1 date. So in order to compile the entire government-wide statement, we had to do a number of things. One of the things we did was to ask agencies to submit pre-audited data to us by February the 15th, two weeks before the statutory date. Uh, we knew that that data would be largely unaudited, but we said, give us something on the February 15th so we can get started, and you can submit adjustments to us after the fact. We did that, and, uh, but even when we closed off the consolidated statement, there were still some agency audits that had not been completed. In order to meet that statutory date, uh, several things were absolutely crucial to that. One, we needed the agencies submitting data out of all their separate accounting systems to the Treasury using the standard general ledger codes that Treasury maintains. We also needed them to telecommunicate the data to us over our electronic fax system. Um, and thirdly, we needed some very dedicated and conscientious people in the Treasury Department to pull all these numbers together prepare all the narrative uh, for the statements and get everything to J.O. on time. Gene Dodaro recognized some of his people. Mr. Chairman, if you don't object, I'd like to just mention a few. Uh, why, why don't they stand up if you call out their names? Okay, I doubt that uh, they're all here, and we don't have as many, perhaps, um, preparing the statement as we're engaged in auditing it. Uh, but we have a small group of about 13 people that uh, is managed by uh, Faye McCrary, who uh, did yeoman work here. We have a couple of professional accountants, uh, Gary Ward and Jose Placer, who uh, did a lot of the technical work. And we have a number of supervisors, managers, including Bill Patriarca, Jim Chambers, Holden Hogue, uh, who oversaw the preparation. Uh, we had Ron Longo from the department that uh, helped us in a great way. So uh, to the extent that these folks are here, I wish they would briefly stand. The rest are working, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we thank you. Tell the rest we thank you. It's a tough job pulling these documents together and pull, moving all that data around, those data. It, it was a huge undertaking, and uh, we were very pleased to be able to submit the report in a timely basis and pledge to do so in the future as well. Uh, the, the publication of this statement is you know, another stage in the administration's continuing efforts to improve management and efficiency in government. Uh, as, as has been mentioned, we were strong supporters of the Government Management Reform Act. Uh, the audit results provide the roadmap for our improvement efforts, and a number of those are underway. A note on some of the things that are in the financial statements and some of the things that are not. By and large, the accounting standards require that those federal entities that are in the president's budget be included in our consolidated financial statements. And generally speaking, those entities which are not in the president's budget are not in our consolidated financial statements. For example, the government-sponsored enterprises are not in our financial statements because they're privately owned. Uh, the Federal Reserve operations uh, are not in the budget. Uh, the monetary policy aspects are usually treated separately from the rest of government. Uh, so they are not included in the totals in our financial statement. We do have a footnote explaining the uh, role of the Federal Reserve system and our relationship with it. Um, Anything that's privately owned, some of the post-exchange military operations are privately owned. Uh, we um, would exclude things like Amtrak, 
uh, even though we get some money from the federal government, it is privately owned. The other caveat that I would like to just mention briefly in terms of reading the financial statement is that you have to appreciate the fact that there are a lot of assets that aren't on that balance sheet. Um, the government produces a lot of assets that they don't wind up owning themselves. We invest in highways and airports and water projects, school buildings. Uh, these are assets on somebody else's balance sheet. Uh, we show the cost of those, but they don't show up on our balance sheet. Then there are some assets that we own, but they don't show up on the balance sheet under current accounting standards right now. The public domain land, for example, uh, almost 80% of the acreage in the United States, there's no value placed on that public domain land on our balance sheet. We have natural resources, including oil and gas and timber, uh, that are assets the government owns, but they're not being valued on the balance sheet. We include information in the statements on those items. Uh, and in future reports, under accounting standards that take effect in subsequent years, we'll be providing even more information on many of those kinds of items. In conclusion, I'd just like to say that since 1990, uh, there has been a lot accomplished, and I appreciate the chairman and Mr. Army's recognition uh, of some of those accomplishments. Obviously, we have a long way to go, a lot of things that need to be worked on. Uh, Treasury is committed to working with the Office of Management and Budget, the General Accounting Office, and the agencies. We have efforts underway to deal with some of those uh, areas that were cited as problems, the reconciliation of the checkbooks with agencies and treasury accounts, uh, the elimination of the intragovernmental transactions, which have created difficulties in uh, reconciling with federal trading partners among agencies. Uh, all of these items are being addressed, and we look forward to improving the quality of the data in future years. With that, Mr. Chairman, I'll conclude my remarks, and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Uh, Mr. If Mr. Dodaro will now join us again, we'll have a panel here and a dialogue between the executive branch and the representative of the legislative branch. Uh, let me just ask uh, first on uh, the case of GAO. Uh, what effect, if any, does the lack of effective systems of internal control have on the information provided in the financial statements? And what about ad hoc reports and inquiries made by management at various agencies, OMB, OMB and also Congress? Uh, do you have any feeling on that? I think uh, the uh, weaknesses in internal controls are a very important uh, uh, issue. And uh, our, basically, our finding or in many of the uh, agencies is that you cannot rely on the internal controls, and particularly the computer controls, in order to do the audit. So there's a lot of testing that's done uh, and ad hoc procedures that are developed. Uh, our view is that those internal control weaknesses really need to be fixed along with getting uh, more accurate information if you're really going to have the systems in place to generate information on a reliable, timely basis. Right now, that doesn't exist in most parts of the federal government. So there's a lot of ad hoc data gathering uh, that's put in place. And then when it's subjected to the, the rigors of an audit, and somebody asks to go behind the information, as the auditors do, and how did you generate that estimate? How did you come up with that figure? What about this or that? Uh, that basically the data is not there. So fixing the internal control problems across the government is an integral part of being able to produce reliable, timely information. Your statement uh, in your formal testimony discussed widespread computer control weaknesses. You were concerned correctly about security. You mentioned, as did the administration, the year 2000 problem. And I just wonder, what effect, if any, do these weaknesses have in the government's efforts to gain control of its resources in terms of com basic computer weaknesses? Or have we never put the information into the database to start with? In, in terms of, I'm not sure I understand. Well, I'm, I'm thinking about uh, one 
we do have a problem on internal controls between computers. Some don't talk to each other, oh. even within the same executive department. Then the question comes in talking to each other within the executive branch. Then comes the question of can GAO audit that and find it, yeah. and what do we need to do about solving some of that problem? Yeah, ba basically, one of the, the core tenets <coughs> of, uh, of OMB's plan and CFO Council plan is to develop integrated financial management systems. That, that really lies at the heart of a lot of the problems at the Defense Department, for example, is that the systems aren't integrated, so you don't have the normal checks and balances in place. So basically, the, the computer weaknesses that occur, a lot of the systems were generated as standalone systems. And in fact, most of the information to prepare the financial statement, say for example at defense, comes from logistical systems, about 80% of the information. And also, there are weaknesses in the uh, general ledger control systems of agencies. So that check that you'd have in place with a general ledger system and check and balance with the logistical systems are not there. One thing I didn't mention in my opening statement that's in our report was the legislation the Congress passed in 1996 called the Federal Financial Management Improvement Act. What that act requires... That was Senator Brown's legislation. Yes, wasn't it, it? It, exactly. And uh, what that legislation requires is beginning in fiscal year 1997, auditors doing audits under the CFO Act are to determine whether or not the agencies not only meet accounting standards, but meet systems requirements that are published by the Joint Financial Management Improvement uh, program and, and codified by in the executive branch OMB bulletins, as well as the standard general ledger. Uh, so far, this fiscal year, only four agencies have really passed that test, uh, which shows you some indication of the underlying systems weaknesses and the computer uh, uh, controls that need to be fixed in order to meet th the objective that you're talking about. That piece of legislation is a very good complement to the audit requirement because it is, it is basically driving the agencies not only to have end of year data that's accurate, but making these systems changes to be able to have uh, data year round that can have some integrity to it. Well, as I remember, the last time I looked into the Defense Department when I was searching for that 25 billion they couldn't account for, there were 49 different accounting systems in the Department of Defense. Now, is that still true? <laughs> Actually, Mr. Chairman, they're, they're at last count, I think, 249. 249. 249. Well, they, they must have, they they must have the dropped off, the, off, off. the zeros yes. off <laughs> when they sent it over here. I thought it was bad enough to have 49 at the time. And yeah. so now it's 249. Well, the, the, yeah, the, the, they have been about uh, the process of, of trying to consolidate and, and migrate their systems. But as uh, Ed mentioned in his opening uh, remarks, they don't have an overall systems architecture. You know, one of the the key requirements in the Klinger Cohen Act that set up the chief information officers were requiring agencies to have an architecture. And unless you have an architecture that shows the data flows and that has technical standards that the systems can inter, uh, uh, interrelate with one another and be interoperable, you're not going to be able to, to uh, uh, design systems that could talk to one another. And, and those architectures are not in place now. It's a goal. Uh, as Ed knows, as, as chairman of the, the uh, CIO Council, the CIOs have made that an important goal to have architectures. So this is a case where the CIOs really need to work with the CFOs to put in place data uh, architectures and systems that can generate this type of information. I can get in one question to Mr. DeSee before uh, yielding. In your statement, you state that your goal is a clean and timely audit opinion on the consolidated statements. By the, two th by the year 2000, with half the agencies not able to issue audited financial statements in a timely way, and only eight of the 24 having clean opinions in the second year the Government Management Reform Act required such audits, five years after the Act was passed, what makes you believe this goal is attainable? I think in uh, what you see before you today is a visual representation of the working together of Treasury, GAO, and OMB. What you don't see, and you're going to have another set of hearings, is the work that the agencies are doing. My optimism, or my setting the bar high, and I'll admit here today that I'm setting the bar high, is based on work that GAO is currently doing, the people behind us, the work that OMB and Treasury are currently doing at the Defense Department. I met with the controller of the Defense Department on Monday, and we talked about the inventory control system and how the inventory control system was developing. GAO has done some marvelous work 
with DOD in using logistics systems, using inventory systems, and getting the information and using sampling techniques. Uh, last night I met with HICFA. HICFA a year ago had a disclaimer on its opinion from its inspector general. This year the opinion will be qualified. It will not be a disclaimer. It's not clean yet. But the major items, the, as, as my, my good friend Woody Jackson, who's not here and deserves to be honored, uh, he set the framework for this. As Woody Jackson said, the thunder boomer issues in HICFA uh, that would impede our ability to get a clean statement government-wide have been dealt with. The issue that, uh, that we, we always work on in auditing, and I'll ask Gene or Jerry to comment on, is materiality. The fact that, let's say, two or three agencies don't have a clean opinion in their own books, those qualifications may not be material to the larger entity. Uh, Mr. Army, when he spoke earlier of, of his bass boat, his bass boat probably isn't material to Mr. Army's overall net worth. Uh, even though he, he can't find it. I don't know his net worth, so I'd, uh, I wouldn't want to comment. But what we're doing, what we're working on very hard, the reason we were worried about the IRS, the reason we were worried about Social Security, the reason we were worried about uh, GSA, the reason we were worried about energy, the reason we were worried about the Bureau of Public Debt, those entities, all of which are now clean, would have a, materially, a material impact on the government as a whole. If we couldn't calculate our environmental liabilities from the old Nuclear Regu Regulatory Commission, or if we couldn't calculate the revenues coming in from the IRS, if we couldn't calculate the Social Security payments with, and be able to, to explain how they work, those would be material. DOD property, plant, and equipment and inventory is material. DOD environmental liability is material. HICFA payment systems and, and reconciliation of their, uh, of their accounts receivable is material. So we're working together, the three of us working together, on the big material items at the same time the agencies are working on either their components or their department-wide entities. And I would ask Jerry or Gene, uh, we've worked very closely with the comment. Yeah, I, I um, uh, reinforce what Ed's talking about, but I've al Ed also knows that I mentioned that achieving that clean opinion in 1999 is a stretch goal, yes, as sir, I would call it. And uh, I also think that the Defense Department is the critical path to that goal. Uh, as Ed mentioned, by any standards, DOD is, is material to the assets, the liabilities, and, and also net costs, as you mentioned, the, the uh, uh, problem disbursement problem over at DOD. And there are other key parts of the federal government that need to, to work on that, and I think our recommendations address that. I think also the government-wide accounting issues that I articulated need to be able to do that. And I'd also reinforce the uh, point that was made earlier by both Jerry and Ed, is that there are new standards coming into play uh, in the next couple of years that are going to require uh, uh, agencies to develop full cost aligned with program activities to come up with deferred maintenance cost, which is a very important component that I know the appropriation committees are looking forward to having some reliable data on what are the deferred costs of, of uh, operating the federal government. Uh, there's a revenue standard coming in place that would require IRS to report by type of tax, something they're not currently able to do. So that could, uh, we're trying to work with them to figure out the best way to do that. So the combination of, of major parts of the government that still need a lot of attention, the new standards that are coming in place, uh, and uh, I think the key goal is just uh, out, not hard work and determination to, to really address these problems head on. And I believe uh, progress is possible, but it will take uh, a, a much more uh, elevated effort to achieve that goal. I thank the gentleman. Uh, since I went well over my five minutes, I yield to the gentleman from Ohio, the uh, ranking minority member, Mr. Kucinich, 10 minutes for questioning the witnesses. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the chair for his indulgence and uh, begin by saying that this first ever audit of the federal government's books submitted today rep represents a, a monumental effort by the administration and by the GAO. And it's the largest such audit in history. American people need to understand this, that it's required enormous uh, data transmissions, unprecedented reconciliations, and development and application of new accounting principles and systems. And I would like to commend everyone uh, and every one of the witnesses for accomplishing this task on time. It was a huge effort. And it could not have been possible without the dedicated work of thousands of men and women at the General Accounting Office, the Department of Treasury, and the Office of Budget Management. So at this moment, uh, they ought to be congratulated, and I, I thank them. 
the administration, it should be pointed out, has not only balanced the budget, it's dedicated to bringing more financial accountability to government, and this audit is a milestone in that effort. American taxpayers expect, and they deserve, a full accounting of when and where and how their tax dollars are spent. I know the chairman of this committee has been very dedicated to that, and I salute him for that. And the uh, president and the National Performance Review under Vice President Gore has embraced this principle early in their first term. I think we all remember that in September of 1993, the NPR recommended the preparation of annual consolidated financial report and the creation of comprehensive government-wide accounting standards. This proposal became part of law as a, in the uh, Government Management Reform Act of 1994 that was passed by our Congress and eagerly signed by the President. The American people are going to be pleased to know that many of our government's most important agencies have received clean audit opinions. Everyone sure wants to know that the IRS has a clean audit opinion. And with the issue surrounding Social Security, we all want to know that the Social Security Administration has a clean audit opinion. That should give people faith in that system. And of course, the Bureau of Public Debt. Now, other agencies are making good progress and moving towards clean opinions. Uh, from what I've seen presented and information that our committees received, the administration's committed to resolving the decades-old problems in financial and asset management. Uh, 23 of 24 agencies have promised to have timely and clean opinions for fiscal year 2000. We've seen steady progress from the agencies on this front and should expect it to continue. Now, to be sure, we have problems that remain, and I know this uh, committee under the chairman is sure going to get to those problems. For example, you look at the Department of Defense. Uh, this committee has been very active in its oversight of financial management problems at DOD, and I commend the chair for his active pursuit of the issue. Uh, DOD has some serious problems accounting for assets, inventory, and equipment, and it's uh, also severely underestimated the amount of liability faced from environmental costs, something that I'm personally very concerned about. Uh, this administration at least has brought us to the point where almost 100 percent of the federal government is, is at least audited compared with only 30 percent in 1990. 100 percent today, close to 100 percent, and 30 percent in 1990. Uh, that's, a, that's a huge accomplishment. And in addition, the number of eight major agencies receiving clean audit opinions has climbed steadily from only two in 1990 to what is expected to be 10 this year. So it's real progress on a difficult uh, problem. And I think as we begin uh, looking into the implications of the audit, we can at least uh, celebrate the, uh, the moment by saying that we've come a long way. Uh, there is a, uh, certainly a long uh, way to go. In the President's, uh, I'd like to ask Mr. DeSiv, in the President's uh, budget for fiscal year 1999, the administration identified 22 key management objectives. A third on that list, which I'm sure you're familiar with because you have put it together, financial management, present performance and cost information in a timely, informative, and accurate way consistent with federal accounting standards. Assure the integrity of federal financial in information by completing audits and gaining unqualified opinions for all Chief Financial Officer Act agencies and on the federal government as a whole. Uh, what I'd like you to do, Mr. DeSiv, could you place the objective of improving federal financial management in some historical perspective so we can help us even more clearly understand the significance of this moment? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, the chairman talked about the Hoover Commission in the 50s um, calling for accounting standards, calling for an accrual basis of accounting. And it's really taken us uh, an enormously long time, almost 50 years, uh, to realize the benefits um, the CFOs Act in 1990 for the first time created organizations of men and women who were exclusively dedicated to financial management. We've had good success in populating those organizations, not only with the CFOs, but with the deputy CFOs. Deputy CFOs tend to be permanent career civil servants um, who are the permanent CFO community as the uh, political CFOs come and go, bringing valuable talent. I was one myself, so I can hardly decry the political nature of the CFOs. They've been, had good access to their secretaries, good access to their administrators. So that was terribly important. It required a small group of agencies to have comprehensive audits. I think the value of the audit at HUD, when I, and I haven't looked at the numbers yet, but when I got to HUD, there was a disclaimer of opinion 
there were about, and I, I'm not taking credit for this at all, please. There were about uh, 40 some material weaknesses. This year, HUD will have one single qualification on its opinion. I haven't seen the number of material weaknesses. FHA and Ginny Mae, the two major components of HUD, will continue to have clean audit opinions as they have in the past. So it's that kind of progress of the CFO Act, but that wasn't enough. GMRA needed to extend to the rest of the 24 uh, CFO Act agencies and to the government as a whole that same high hurdle, that same stretch goal of first getting an audit, second getting a clean and timely opinion. We were able to work with this committee uh, under the, uh, uh, the, the leadership of its former chairs to get that done. And this committee was, uh, was absolutely instrumental in causing that to happen and continues in its oversight in making sure I've testified before on the CFO Act implementation in this committee before this chair. May and sorry. May I ask you, though, I, you know, I'd, I'd just like to keep this going. What particular challenges do you, do you still have ahead in, in producing unqualified and, and timely audited financial statements for the 24 CFO agencies? I think the challenges can be divided into probably three categories. The first category is being able to first reconcile the data in their existing systems to be able to know the inventory data, to be able to know the loan outstanding data, to be able to properly tie that back to the historical patterns in those areas for loans. So it's first knowing the data, being comfortable with the data. Secondly, being able to establish systems that will bring that data together from contractors as well as internally. HICFA's biggest problem at the moment in, in getting a clean opinion will be reconciling contractor-based data. We have to remember that there are, I think there are currently nine or ten, I'll stand corrected on that, major contractors who process for HICFA. Their systems have never been designed to be integrated with HICFAs. So they've got to know what data is there, the contractors have to know, HICFA has to be able to upstream that data. And finally then to reconcile, to be able to reconcile with Treasury, to be able to reconcile internally any of the inconsistencies as they exist. Those are the big challenges, getting control of data, getting control of systems, and a reconciliation process over time. Uh, b before we uh, send this back to the chair and to uh, uh, the other members, uh, there's one thing that I've been wondering as I go over this material, and that is the uh, chair was, uh, has been showing leadership on this issue of Y2K, uh, the uh, difficulty when we go to the year 2000 with the uh, computers being uh, set to revert back to the beginning of the uh, century. My question to you is, what particular challenges do you face with respect to Y2K that would be, that would impact on your ability to audit uh, have an, uh, either uh, some of these accounts we just talked about or an ongoing audit process with the government? Because when you the cross that, when you cross that, that border, right. where are you with uh, financial uh, Accounting. Given the fact that it was an audit question, may I ask Mr. Dodaro, the yeah, auditor, Mr. to Dodaro. answer that one? Yes. Yeah, basically, uh, a lot of the uh, financial transactions are uh, conducted through various uh, integrated systems in place. For example, the uh, federal government's bill paying activities, the agency's financial systems have to integrate with Treasury's financial management service, who then make payments to financial institutions across the country. So any inability of those data systems to, to uh, basically uh, uh, deal with this problem and communicate accurately. In loan programs, obviously you have uh, loan repayment schedules, you have uh, dates when payments are due, uh, default rates could show up even though the loan might be paid, installment agreements, you have IRS revenue collection activities. There's a big challenge at IRS in making the changes in their system uh, to deal with the year 2000 problem at the same time they're dealing with changes in the tax law. And they have to do both to be ready in the same time. It's a huge challenge. So revenue collection activities to the government could be affected. The ability, mo many of the federal government programs rely on eligibility information. So it's obviously important to have accurate information on date uh, uh, calculations for age of people uh, as well. And without the change, you know, the computer would read uh, you know, 2000, somebody who turned 65 in, in two, 2000, if it's not corrected, would not recognize that they're eligible for Social Security or Medicare, for example. So it could have an enormous effect on the federal government's activities if this problem isn't fixed. And that's why we're raising it as part of this audit opinion. 
Uh, as you know, Congressman Kucinich, we're, we were here two weeks ago talking about the broad implications of the problem on service delivery. In this context, we're raising it because it could have uh, a very uh, significant effect on the federal government's ability to report accurately uh, in terms of its activities and carry out many of the financial aspects of its programs. Thank you. I want to thank the chair for his kindness. Thank you. Well, I thank the gentleman. That's a very important question. And if I might, uh, just to help uh, the point along, I will uh, at this point put in page 23 of the General Accounting Office report where it gets into this uh, in the document. And it carried over from the draft uh, to the next page. Uh, so I thank the gentleman for a series of good questions. And I yield 10 minutes to my colleague from Texas, Mr. Sessions, the vice chairman of the committee. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, first, I would like to respond to my good friend uh, from Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, when he talked about uh, accurate historical significance. Uh, I would like to just, for the record, make sure that that's accurate historical review, and that is this administration fought balancing the budget all they could do. This administration, in my opinion, did not balance the budget. It was done because the Congress of the United States insisted that we balance the budget, and thank goodness the President did sign that balanced budget agreement, which is now the law of the land. Uh, Mr. DeSev, I would um, I appreciate you being here today. Uh, I think if the, if the truth were known, uh, that you and I, in the performance of your duties and mine, uh, meet regularly. Uh, we get to see each other outside of uh, you being a witness and raising your hand, and uh, we swearing to tell the truth, and I want to thank you for your uh, the way you perform your duties and the honesty and uh, the forthrightness which uh, you present yourself, and I want to thank you for being here today. Uh, with that, in the spirit in which uh, I've said that, I would like to ask that, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, if we approach the witnesses to give them a copy of a document which uh, is in our packets. <clears throat> uh, Mr. DeSev, um, I would like to see if you if you have not seen this sheet of paper, uh, if you could look at it, because what it talks about there is it has the agencies broken down, and it talks about their financial management status. And uh, the uh, word has been used today, statutory duties. And I wondered if you could take a minute and tell me the statutory duties of uh, department heads and that that they have in relationship to financial management status and, and their, their performance of those duties. Each department will be somewhat different, so let me speak generically uh, at a fairly high level and but try to cover your question. Um, every department head has to um, sign their, the FIMFIA report, which deals with internal controls. Uh, every department head has to sign a representation letter regarding what they know about financial information, whether it's materially misleading, if anything come to their attention. So they must be engaged in the audit process as the ultimate client. Uh, in addition, the inspector generals continuously, uh, in their own opinions, point out material weaknesses and reportable conditions, and under FEMFIA, corrective action plans have to be put in place by each of the agency heads. I think those are their primary responsibilities uh, along the way from a, from a statutory point of view vis-a-vis -vis financial management. And they're very serious responsibilities. Well, I am uh, today in looking at this stunned, perhaps not surprised, but uh, I have heard the number and I, I think it is truthful, but I could not swear to that, but that the Department of Justice has had a budget growth of 83 percent since the President has has been our president. So the Department of Justice budget has risen 83 percent. And yet I look at this sheet of paper, which you now have before you, and it says Department of Justice, reliable financial information, no. Effective internal control, no. Compliance with laws and regulations, no. Grade in 1996, F grade in 1997, F. And it really brings about a question in my mind about who is, is and should be under the law. 
at this time the Department of Justice and has been engaged in going out and looking at private industry, engaging themselves and looking at other people who have perhaps violated the law, have not lived up to their uh, spirit of accounting standards, uh, have not done what I would consider to be uh, statutory duties that a CEO may have, and yet at this time I've heard you describe that the Attorney General of the United States has to sign these forms that state that in her duties, statutory duties, that she's been in compliance, and yet we see here that the person who is able to go out and prosecute Americans gets an F and no, no, and no under their status report for their own fiscal accountability. I'm disturbed. I'm disturbed, and I think that this is uh, nothing less than, uh, than something that is uh, intentional. Because year after year, they have received the F. And I wonder how you can help me think through this person that's in, interested in the enforcement of the laws of this country, and they can sign a sheet, and yet an audit will show an F, and yet they are out prosecuting people in this country. I, I want to be very clear about um, their signatures. Their signatures indicate not compliance, that they were compliant, but rather that there were weaknesses, that there were things that happened, and they know of nothing else uh, along the way. So they don't, they don't indicate that they are compliant when they are not compliant. That's, that's not what they do. They properly represent the fact that they are non-compliant. What they're stating is that, that that report, even if it says that they're not in compliance, is true to the best of their to knowledge. To the best probably. of their knowledge. That's correct. I just wanted to be clear about Do that. Do you believe that it would be fair for the Department of Justice and the Attorney General of the United States to apply that same premise to someone involved in an SEC or other violations of this country dealing with financial management of a publicly held company? I, I, I would stand corrected by my auditor friend on my left, but I think that every uh, chief financial officer and every head of a public company has to make a similar set of representations um, when they have an audit done and also in their 10Ks, I believe their 10Ks and their 10Qs have similar kinds of representations. So it's do, do a standard that's similar. Do you believe in any manner that one of these people would be allowed to state of all the deficiencies that they were aware of and yet still sign that report and year after year still this be allowed? Yeah, I'm going to again ask my colleagues to help me on this. I believe the first ever audit of the Justice Department was 1996. I believe they were a GMR agency as opposed to a CFO Act agency. And the department uh, indicates that it's a big challenge. They're what we call a holding company department. They have lots of different pieces. And it's a big challenge with INS. It's a big challenge with the FBI. It's a big challenge with uh, many of their components to comply with the rigorous accounting standards as put in place. Yeah. Their systems were not a priori designed for that purpose. The Securities Act, and I'll ask now my colleague on my far right, of 1933, Jerry? Is that right? The Securities Act of 1933 essentially set corporations on the course that we embark on in 1996. So that applying this, a standard to a corporation is something that we've had experience with for some 60, 65 years. We believe that the Justice Department is working very hard uh, taking very seriously uh, the work that it's trying to do and trying to solve each of its problems. We've seen progress in its component agencies over the two years in which they've been required to do it. So I don't think it's a lack of seriousness of purpose. I think it's simply a question of time before we get to that standard. Yeah. I would just make the statement that uh, those who throw stones should not live in glass houses. Uh, I would like to now uh, ask uh, Mr. Hawk if I could please. There was a statement that was made by Mr. DeSev about a bank card. And sir, I believe that you represent the uh, Treasury Department. And uh, part of the uh, discussion that has taken place today, the word full cost was used as processes are looked at uh, across government, and I am concerned and would like to hear from you about this bank card function. I think the statement was made that uh, it, they want to, the Treasury wants to make sure that uh, no money leaves the, the Treasury that shouldn't. In other words, if it can be held within the Treasury, that would be done. 
and, and I am concerned, uh, although I do not think I've communicated directly with you, I'm concerned about any government agency doing something that is not cost effective uh, and doing something that might be done uh, more cost effectively by someone else. Can you please discuss with me uh, this uh, bank card? Yes, I'd be happy to, Mr. Sessions. Let, let me first uh, put it in context. What we're talking about here is accounting for intra-governmental uh, transactions, that is, transactions in which one government agency is purchasing goods or services uh, from another. Uh, the problem that uh, was encountered in connection with the preparation of these consolidated financial statements is that, uh, th that there was no consistency in the way transactions were uh, intra-governmental transactions were, were booked. So you might have, for example, the Department of Defense uh, making a purchase from the government printing office. And the government printing office uh, may book that uh, in the current period, uh, uh, well, while, while the Department of Defense might book it in a, in a future period so they don't show up in the same, uh, in the uh, accounting in the same fiscal year. Now, uh, that, that is being worked on, that problem is being worked on with, in a much broader context with, with regard to uh, the applicable accounting standards. But the credit card, uh, the intra-governmental credit card is, is also a way that, uh, that we're going to be able to uh, handle that problem. If Does one not exist today? Uh, there, there are some pilot programs uh, that, that are in existence today, but we're, we're moving toward a system in which uh, the, the Department of Defense would be able to pay for that purchase from the government printing office, for example, on a, on a credit card so we would have uh, we would have, uh, uh, and, and as uh, Mr. Seb said, the, the money won't leave the government, but the, the, the accounting will be, in effect, simultaneous, uh, simultaneously recorded because we'll have the two government agencies as parties to a, a so in other words, tr transaction. Prior to today, there has not been or there has been a regular process, perhaps, of the GSA to pay for this and to account for it. We have uh, some other systems. Uh, years ago, we started out with just paper documents that both agencies signed, uh, but then we started developing more automated systems that move the debits and credits between the agencies. In a timely uh, manner. In a timely or manner and better. simultaneously. Okay. Unfortunately, that system was not robust enough to provide all the accounting information along with the financial data that agencies needed to reconcile and know what you know they were paying and what account should be charged. Why, why is it being moved from GSA to Treasury? Uh, if you had an existing system, why did not GSA have an opportunity uh, to go and make their system better? Why are you trying to duplicate or at uh, the moment, to do something yes, like sir. this? Uh, basically, what we're doing is piloting two different uh, applications Trials. at the moment to determine you know, what works best and uh, at some point, you know, we will go with one credit card application probably. We also will have some alternative mechanisms, including some mechanisms that utilize electronic data interchange that agencies can also benefit from. So there, there may not be just one single system that does all intergovernmental transactions, but in different cases, one will work better than another and be more cost effective. Good. Well, I do understand EDI and how it works. I am concerned about the duplication of this system and uh, would like to, Mr. Hawk, uh, speak with you uh, perhaps later uh, in the month on that issue. I am uh, I'm concerned that tough questions have not been asked about this system uh, and what uh, you, its performance uh, and the duplication of that. So I will, I will do that offline and later. Mr. Chairman, thank you. I thank the gentleman and now delighted to yield 10 minutes to our valued colleague from South Carolina, Mark Sanford. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I have just a couple of general questions to start with. Um, in looking at the consolidated financial statement, uh, w when you walk away from the whole in looking at the process, are, are you struck with um, in other words, are, are you struck with a financial statement that suggests scarcity or otherwise? Let me try to answer that question. It was actually answered it the other day. Um, I think the net position is approximately $5 trillion negative. 
I think when you take a five trillion negative and compare that to the nature of the economy of the United States. Well, no, I'm not really going to the national debt. I guess is what I'm suggesting is, is you look at 1.6 or 1.7 trillion dollars being spent, and then you look at, um, you know, as uh, Congressman Army had suggested earlier, a 200-year supply of raincoats, uh, the loss of an $875,000 tugboat, uh, a $460,000 crane being misplaced, a uh, couple of F-18 engines uh, being lost. Uh, I'd seen there with the, the chairman's opening statement, uh, you know, HICFA uh, basically overpaying by $23 billion or uh, within the Social Security Administration an additional billion dollars toward uh, supplemental. I mean, when you look at that sort of process within, in other words, if you compare that to corporate financial statements that you've looked at or individual financial statements that you've looked at, does it suggest to you scarcity or maybe too much money in Washington? It suggests for the need for a much better management of the resources that are there. I can't kind of give you scarcity or surplus, but it certainly uh, bodes for better accountability of those resources. Let me use HICPA as the example. I think you'll see this year that the $23 billion number comes down to $20 billion. That's still not acceptable. Uh, actually, it's a range That's of... That's real money back home in South yes, Carolina. Sir. Yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> it sure is in Pennsylvania where I come yeah. from. Uh, they actually, the auditors actually stated as a range between $11 billion and about $24 billion this year. It's about 11% um, of, uh, of HICFA's um, HICWIS payments. It means about 89 percent of the payments are made accurately, about 11 percent are inaccurate. What that tells us as we begin looking at the reasons, was it have, medical? Have, have you seen that type of error rate uh, in, in, in corporate financial statements you might have looked I have, at? I have not seen that type of error rate in corporate financial statements, and it's also higher than comparable federal programs. I think we need to look very carefully at the fundamental nature of the programs, Medicare and Medicaid, and the logic behind their design. They were designed as, as fast pay programs. They were designed to quickly pay claims for doctors and hospitals without a pre-audit process built into them. The claims are paid by contractors. Contractors merely ascertain the mathematical accuracy of a doctor's bill by statute, by statute and then H H they make the payment. HICFA then can go in on a post-audit basis. The doctors are very concerned now, the hospitals are very concerned, even in the post-audits that the department has begun, that there's going to be a lack of timely payment along the way, that their payments will be challenged and it will interrupt the payment flow. So we have to look at the logic of the system. And I know the uh, secretary and the You're inspector... You're saying basically that it's an illogical system. Um, I'm saying that Congress, in, in legislating the way that the HICFA payment system worked, set up a criteria that was logical. Let's get these providers paid quickly so that we can hold their cost of funds down, so that we can keep the, the uh, system operating well. That was the logic of the system. I'm not saying that, that it is illogical. Mm -hmm. I'm suggesting the logic of a different system might say let's do a pre-audit first. Let's set up some selective pre-auditing criteria. Mm -hmm. Let's pay 85% of the bill and then chase for 15%. I mean, there's right. lots of different logics that you could impose on the system. So if you, if you were to look at the overall financial statement, we, you might not be able to make determination as to whether there's too much money in Washington or whether there's a scarcity of money in Washington. But what you would suggest, it seems to me, is by what you've said in terms of process, is clearly Washington at times is not setting its priorities. In other words, whether it's 200-year uh, supply of raincoats or, or a host of other things, that there is not enough priority setting in the budgetary process in Washington. That would be a safe statement? I think it goes even beyond the budgetary process because management is all about setting priorities mm -hmm. and deciding what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. I'll, I'll go back to the little homely example of the credit card. We don't need to be in the business of developing new financial management systems that are proprietary to the federal government. The Visa network can do the same kind of interchange, the same kind of transaction management that we do. We should take advantage of those commercial systems sure. wherever we can. That's management. That's priority yeah. setting. Marshall, that, that, can, I, can I add something to this uh, yeah. discussion? The questions you're asking now are only possible because of the financial audits. Mm -hmm. For the first time, we're quantifying the magnitude of these problems. Before the first financial audit of HICFA, Everybody knew there were problems in the Medicare and overpayments and fraud and abuse, but you only had anecdotal information. Mm -hmm. We worked at GAO with the uh, HHS Inspector General to develop this sampling methodology to take paid claims. And now 
uh, you have a measure to ask these questions, and you have a measure that's now embedded in HICFA's performance plan to bring that payment down. You, we didn't know before, and uh, as a government, sure. where we were uh, dealing with this and where we should put our priorities. The, 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 uh, the, the estimate not only told us we had $23 billion of HICFA, it pinpointed types of providers where we were having a higher incidence of, of, of problem, like for, such as home health care providers. Mm -hmm. So uh, without these annual financial audits to track progress, uh, you're not going to have the basis to ask those type of questions. But, but following up on that very thought, in other words, in terms of tracking where we are, we had a brief conversation earlier uh, in, in this dialogue on accrual versus basically cost accounting. As I understand it, we run the federal government books on cost accounting period, correct? They've pretty much been run on a cash cash right. basis prior. Right. We're trying to get them on an accrual basis with these financial. Stuff. So in other words, as you look at accrual, I was looking at some of the numbers in the uh, in, in the back of the supplement here. Uh, for instance, if you look at Social Security, uh, the numbers that uh, were here seem to suggest that there was roughly about a $3 trillion liability with Social Security. Based on accrual accounting, we'd need to take that into account today. What do you think is the best way to, to I mean, to have us recognize on a daily basis, for instance, the enormity of the Social Security problem. Yeah. Well, in other words, should should we be should in other words are we are we in fact on an accrual basis not really running a surplus? Uh, uh, let me. If you take into account the contingent liability with Social Security. Uh, let me try to address that, and then uh, my colleagues can join in. Uh, at present the accrual accounting standards that we have require for Social Security that the amount due and payable at the end of the year be shown as a liability on the balance sheet. In terms of those future liabilities for future payments, we disclose a great deal of information both in the notes and in our stewardship section of the report. I guess, let me turn it around. I guess what I'm asking is this. With the budget that the President sends every year to the Congress, basically the formal debt of the United States government is listed. What you all have done here is gone a step further and listed the contingent liability that comes with Social Security. Do you think it would be a good idea for the, this contingent liability to be listed as a part of our federal budget? Yeah, let me try to answer that because I have point B. Um, the budget rules, the scorekeeping rules of the Budget Enforcement Act and now the Balanced Budget Act uh, I'll use my word again, have a logic to them. You'd have to go well, back. Can, can we go back, though? Would that be a yes or a no on that last question? Let me, can I do, I'll, I, I, but just I, I, I want to hear the I yes promise, or no part first. I promise, first. I'll, give you, I prom <laughs> I promise I'll give you a yes or no. In okay, in all right. <laughs> in order to do what you're suggesting, that is, use an accrual method, and many state and local governments actually budget on a modified accrual basis, and it's only modified as to the timing of expenses and the timing of revenue. It's, it's modified from straight accrual. They do use that in their budgeting. Um, the federal government has chosen not to do that. Keep in mind, the chairman's only given me 10 minutes here. I'm sorry. So. <laughs> uh, the, what the federal government has said is, here are the rules, here are the scorekeeping rules. In order to do what you're suggesting, you'd have to go back and unwind all of those rules. I think it's unlikely that we're going to want to do that anytime soon. So collectively, that I say we, I really mean the Congress and the administration. So my answer is no. I think we have to deal with it as a liability, understand in the budget what our current payment is, and then spend a lot of time disclosing and discussing how we're going to fix the thing on a projected basis. Which but wouldn't, is based the on wouldn't the budget be the best place to disclose it? I think we can certainly disclose it, but to use it as a budgeting tool beyond what it is now, I think would require a tremendous change in our budgeting rules. But in other words, given the, in other words, the numbers I just looked at here say that this contingent liability, if you include Medicare and Social Security, is basically greater than the existing national debt that we recognize. I'd have to do the math on that. I'm, not, I'm just not yeah. sure. We certainly uh, need to have that out in front of everybody's eyes. In uh, the last few seconds that I have here, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> try and squeeze it all in, Chairman. All right. The, the, um, on this last chart uh, that was up here just a moment ago, um, it, it talked about 58% uh, of the entities had received clean opinions. 
Uh, my question was, uh, could we break that out in dollar terms? In other words, 58% of the entities might be a big part of the government, or frankly, it might be a little part of the government. So out of the 1.6 trillion or 1.7 trillion that we spend annually, what percent uh, in dollar terms got clean opinions? Yeah, I, I need to do that for you because I haven't done it. It's 100% of the revenue. So if you look at both sides of the budget, it's 100% of the revenue got a clean opinion because IRS is one of those five components. It's 100% okay. of, the, of the debt. Okay. But I can't tell you what it is of the expenses, but I'll be happy to do that calculation on both a budget authority basis and an outlay basis. We started to do it and we had ran into some complications, but we can, we can put that together right. for you. And, and one last question, and that is, um, uh, you've, dis uh, you've discussed at length uh, goals for, uh, you know, unqualified opinions, <coughs> if you will. Uh, m my question would be, what are we doing in terms of a next step, which is sort of goals for effective systems that lock in a lot of these things we're talking about? Um, the chief financial officers that we referred to earlier have three primary goals. One of them is clean financial statements. The second is systems that make sense. Gene and Jerry and I all serve on the Joint Financial Management Improvement Project, which is setting the system, the, the computer system standards, and also is reaching out to find new and better ways to get the private sector to design good workable systems for the government. We have a schedule at GSA that folks buy off. It takes time and frankly, financial systems have a low priority within many organizations, believe it or not. This is helping to raise that priority, but most people would rather spend the extra dollar on programs rather than on systems fixes. And that's true in some cases in congressional appropriations committees as well as within departments. So it's a, we continue to fight a battle to get the money for the systems. Luckily, computer costs are coming down and we're using more off-the-shelf software and more commercial companies are coming into the government market, all of which is going to be a tremendous help. Right. Thank, I thank you, gentlemen. I add uh, on to that just uh, uh, briefly that the Federal Financial Management Improvement Act of 1996, if auditors determine the systems aren't in conformance with the standards that uh, Mr. Sev just mentioned, the agency head has to submit a remedial plan to bring the agency in compliance with those system standards within a three-year time frame. So that also is forcing the agency head to deal with the deficiencies noted in the audit report and with the ultimate goal of fixing the underlying financial systems as well as getting the clean opinion. So that's another legislative tool. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, I thank the gentleman from South Carolina. We're going to go for a second round at five minutes each, and I will yield my position and to give the five minutes to my colleague, the ranking minority member, who has to leave for another subcommittee. Mr. Kucinich. Five Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I do indeed have to go to a markup in the uh, Education uh, Committee. I, I would ask staff to put the um, uh, chart up that talks of progress towards sound financial management. If, uh, if you could do that, uh, very grateful. Thank you. I, I would just like to point out again, as you look at this chart, and we start with 1990, in 1990, you had about uh, uh, four agencies, major agencies, submitting financial uh, statements, and about half that receiving a clean audit. We go to 1994, uh, the, amounts, uh, the amount began to climb to uh, actually triple to 12 agencies, major agencies, submitting financial statements. And uh, the amount which uh, received a clean audit doubled. And then we go to 1996, and we have even more agencies, uh, about 22, 23 in 1996, submitting financial statements and uh, about a uh, half dozen receiving a clean audit. And in 1997, uh, 24 major agencies submitting financial statements and uh, about 8 to 10 receiving a clean audit, according to the uh, chart, on progress towards sound financial management. And I think that progress is what needs to be the guiding word here. And progress involves uh, trial and error. It involves uh, pointing out the accomplishments as well as pointing out As we do that, I think it's fair to say, though, that the effort to bring the government to better financial accounting uh, doesn't mean that we suspend the administrative functions of the various departments which may uh, have some shortcomings in their financial accounting. 
I mean, imagine, for example, if we had a condition where an FBI agent, hot on the chase of a suspect, suddenly cornered the individual, and when he was about to make the arrest, was informed by the suspect, sir, the Department of Justice does not yet have its accounting straightened out, so therefore you ought not arrest me. Now that uh, would take that agent in shock, of course, but uh, the implications of any federal agency suspending until their accounting would be done is, uh, is interesting. Uh, if we were to uh, encounter Iraq, could you imagine how we would respond if Saddam Hussein suddenly uh, told the Department of Defense, look, get your house in order first, don't come after me. Um, we know that you have some things that you have to resolve. And I commend the chair of this committee and every member of this committee to put you to the test to do it. Because you have to do it. But at the same time, with all due respect, uh, there are statutory functions which must continue, obligations which the government has constitutionally to exercise, notwithstanding the condition of accounting at some of the departments, which does need to be challenged and does need to be improved. And with that, uh, uh, my dear friend, the chair, I'm going to have to uh, go to my markup, but I, I thank you for your diligence in uh, calling the uh, administration to a higher standard of accounting, because I think it's this, it's this process which enables the, uh, 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 us to uh, form a more perfect uh, union. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Uh, we have a few closing questions here. First, a very simple one. What did the audit cost? I realize we aren't done yet, but uh, have you got a ballpark figure? Uh, basically, uh, the uh, CFO Act, requires OMB to report as part of their annual plan the cost of compliance with the act. So I know as Ed puts together the figures uh, for this uh, next year, uh, it'll be included in that report to be submitted this summer. Uh, the only thing I can speak to uh, today, Mr. Chairman, are GAO's uh, costs uh, for doing this audit are, are uh, for this fiscal year, as we focused on the 1997 audit, it cost us about three, three and a half million dollars to audit the $1.7 trillion of the uh, Internal Revenue Service and the uh, uh, several hundred uh, billions of dollars of uh, accounts receivable, which eventually got down to $28 billion, which is uh, collectible. It took about another uh, 4 or $5 million for us to audit the $3.8 trillion at the Bureau of Public Debt uh, and the $242 uh, billion interest payment on that debt, as well as the uh, amounts, $1.6 trillion owed to the uh, trust fund activities. And then in total, it cost us about maybe another, uh, I'd say, a 12 to uh, $15 million to do the computer control work, uh, help support the IGs in doing some of the audits and covering the rest of the financial, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, the, the uh, agencies across the uh, government. I would note uh, a couple of things. One, we've issued uh, quite a few reports out of this effort in addition to the overall audit opinion, which I'd be happy to supply uh, for the record. Uh, some of them are footnoted in the financial statement as well. We've issued, for example, a series of reports helping DOD focus on the environmental liability issue, pointing out what they need to consider in order to do that. Uh, also, I recognize that we've been preparing for this for a number of years, and uh, so in the 1996 process and earlier years, we uh, engaged quite a bit with the inspector generals across the government to, to work on their activities and actually work jointly with a, with a number of the IGs, particularly at HHS. Uh, so to sum it up, uh, what would we say the estimated cost is? I won't hold you to it, but I just like a ballpark figure, and I'll give you, uh, you know, a couple hundred million in either direction. <laughs> Well, in, in, in my household, that bass, uh, that bass boat is a material item, uh, so I, I would I would like to uh, to to provide that for the record, Mr. Chairman. I I, I, I gave you GAO's costs for yeah, the year. Uh, I don't know what well, the cost of all the Inspector General yeah, well, activities. We just have a tabby for this year. They're still finishing up, as you've indicated, with the incompletes. So we'll get those. We'll combine so them with Gene. What is the ballpark on this? See, what I can do is do a simple thing. It cost us $3 million for the first audit in the history of Congress, 210-year history. 
So I can multiply 24 agencies by 3 million as a start and say, did it cost you 72 million or did it cost 720 million? What was it? Where are we there? The only thing I can yeah. do is give you GAO's cost, which I've, which I've given you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, give, I, it, give it to yeah. me as a bottom line. I heard a lot of ifs, ands, and buts there, too. Oh, okay. So what's the bottom line on well, GAO? Well, the bottom line for, for GAO for the year is about uh, $20 million to, okay. to carry out our activities. And that's without the cost of the, uh, of the IGs added to, to that figure. And I just uh, it wouldn't be fair for me to represent to you what, what their costs were. Yeah. No, no. We'll, we'll ultimately get that. But I was yeah. just curious. Sure, the agencies would be, um, now that they've done a couple of them, would be significantly less than $3 million a copy for most agencies, for the normal agency. Where I can't speak is HHS and DOD. I know that there were some extraordinary costs in HHS for the sampling work they did and then the look behinds. Mm -hmm. And some, and one of the problems, we, I'm not trying to be evasive, I just literally don't know. Uh, in some cases, we have compliance auditing that's going on at the same time we're doing financial statement auditing. HICF is a classic example of that. They, they go in and they find in their sampling that there's a problem with a particular payment, which would help them in the financial statement audit. They immediately begin the compliance process in that regard. So uh, it will only take me a few days to get you the information, but I literally don't have it to hand. It's All right. certainly less we'll than $720 million. Yeah. Um, is well, it I 72 think two million or eighty-three million. I, I, I think I'm closer on the seventy-two, right? I think you're much okay. closer on the seventy-two. Yes, it's the horn system of governmental accounting. <laughs> uh, number two, uh, and I've got two more questions. Number two is I was very interested in what you had to say about the failure of the Department of Defense in the environmental area, because that's been bothering us probably several hundred members in the House and in the Senate who say, look, when are they going to face up to their environmental responsibilities? Now, they've got offices over there at the secretary's level. They've got offices in the service level. And it seems to me uh, part of the problem is their organization. And are they getting things done? Does GAO have any thoughts on that? Have you done an examination of that part of DOD in, in the environmental, in the uh, environmental area? area? Uh, yes, uh, we've, we've had a series of reports, which I can provide for the record. I mean, initially, the department uh, felt they didn't have the information necessary to make the calculations. Uh, we believed otherwise and, and embarked on a series of reports looking in different aspects, uh, for example, in, the, in, in some of the submarines and, and some of the other areas. So we've issued a, a series of reports to them outlining the factors that they need to consider in coming up with the liabilities. I believe they've modified their accounting policies now and intend to try to report that for fiscal year 1998. We encourage them to try to report it in the 97th time frame in accordance with the standards, but that just didn't happen. So we've been giving that a lot of attention, and, and uh, this is you know, part of what we've been trying to do and part of our costs in carrying out this activity is try to come up with solutions as well. We've been spending a lot of time at DOD trying to do that as well as helping them with their inventory counts and helping to try to improve accountability for mission assets. Well, I think we're going to hold a hearing on this in the next two months because I've, after reading this report and the noting you gave to this situation, uh, I think Congress needs to say, hey, what's the problem? Is it just a failure of leadership? Is it a failure of organization? I mean, they've got the money over there, and uh, they certainly get it out of us when they come. This is a very important thing. So my last point I want to make is that uh, Mr. Sanford's question was, were well taken. And I remember Mr. Newman and I were the only people that talked about future liabilities two years ago in the House. And I've left it all to Mr. Newman to keep up that crusade. But you had long-term planning, as I remember, in Social Security at about 70 years out. And you had the short term at about 10 years out. Now, most of us know that we've got a real problem in 2010 when you got the baby boomers hitting and we're going to not anymore have the one billion surplus every week coming into that fund. It's going to go out. We, we have a vote on the floor, but we're going to be done in two minutes. So uh, let me just say on Mr. Sanford's uh, part that uh, what's pertinent here is that the accounting system, which all of you have spent a lot of time improving, is extremely important 
as we get the strategic plans in the right way. And uh, as you know, we've uh, got a bill coming through, a law coming through on that uh, and redoing some of them. And then getting the performance indicators, if the performance indicators are going to have any relevance and be able to enable a cabinet officer and the Office of Management and Budget and the President of the United States, who's the chief executive, to make optional choices, thus priorities, we need the accounting system to go with the strategic plan, to go with the performance indicators. And so I think I'm optimistic here, despite all the holes we can all pick around here. And we do. That's our job. Uh, but let me just say in closing, I want to thank you all for coming here. I think it's been a very interesting discussion. If you have any last words to say about the GAO or the GAO about OMB and Treasury, feel free. We'll give you each 30 seconds. <laughs> any comments? I'll start. I'll say that I have not had a uh, more pleasant relationship than the one I've had with Treasury and GAO. Uh, there's contentiousness, but it's the contentiousness <laughs> of ideas and the contentiousness of trying to solve problems. And I think uh, that's, that's been my experience, and I would uh, defer to my colleagues. I would agree. I think we've had a constructive working relationship. I think uh, you know we've called it as we see it, which is what we need to do at GAO. But we also need to step up and help find solutions to the problem. And we've been solution-oriented. And, and I think we're all after the same goal, which is to give the public what they really uh, deserve. Thank you, gentlemen. Let me just note in conclusion, today's hearing is the first in a series of hearings during which the subcommittee will review the management practices and the financial management practices of the federal government. We have already scheduled the Internal Revenue Service for April 15th, an interesting date, I might add, uh, the <laughs> Department of Defense on April 16th, the Health Care Financing Administration on April 17th, the Inspector Generals as a group on April 21st, uh, the Klinger Cohen procurement acquisition legislation and the flexibility we'll be looking at on April 23rd, federal property management uh, we'll be looking at on uh, May 4th. So in the next month, uh, we have roughly six hearings on just this area going into more uh, depth. And now let me thank the people that arranged this and are arranging those next six hearings. J. Russell George is back against the wall there. Stand up, Russell. Uh, Staff Director and Chief Counsel of the uh, Government Management Information Technology Committee, the professional staff member that has worked particularly on this and explaining to us what's in those fine documents you gentlemen put out is Diane Ginsberg, who's to my left and your right. She's on detail from the General Accounting Office, and we thank you. We're glad to have your experts come in here, and we hope they learn something, and we certainly learn something. John Hines, professional staff member, Matthew Ebert, staff assistant, chief clerk, uh, Welton Lloyd, a congressional fellow working with us, uh, David Coer, a USC, that's if we're not University of South Carolina, it's the University of Southern California, as some know. Uh, as an intern, we're glad to have him. Camilla White, also an intern. And uh, then uh, for the minority, we have Early Green, the staff assistant for the minority. Mark Stevenson, professional staff member. Faith Weiss, professional staff member. And Ann Payne Weiss is our court reporter. And we thank you all. With that, this hearing is adjourned. to say uh, goodbye and thank you very much as always a the pleasure one that i can avoid from time to time <laughs> you can avoid the next six, um, right well i think itmra is ours but is there anything else uh, we'd rather let folks just come up on their own we don't need the nursemaid the igs okay uh igs and itmra will be there for sure okay. thank you
Chairman Stephen Horn and his colleagues are on congressional recess for the next couple of weeks to celebrate Easter and Passover. House members return Tuesday, April 21st to continue the legislative agenda. You can see live House coverage here on C-SPAN. Just ahead, President Clinton's comments Wednesday in Senegal on U.S. commitment to the African continent. After that, White House Press Secretary Mike McCurry on the dismissal of the Paula Jones sexual harassment suit against the president. Then we'll hear from Clinton attorney 